Well, uh, I am honored to have New York State Senator Pete Harcum join us today in another episode of our Big Vision Recovery Culture Series. Thank you for being here. Thanks Pete for was having me. And it's okay for me to call you Pete? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Pete was elected to the New York State Senate in November 2018 and re-elected in November 2020. Since 2019, he was appointed chairman of the Senate Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, where he has introduced over 82 bills dealing with substance use disorder and combating, combating the overdose crisis, the opioid crisis. 13 of those bills were signed into law. That's amazing. Pete is one of the most hardworking, productive members of the New York State Senate, having introduced many bills that have been signed into law and benefit our daily lives. The scope of the bills is just too many for us to even mention today, so we're not going to have time to address them tonight. Senator Pete Harkham is one of the most respected elected leaders in New York and has been in recovery for over 30 years. That in itself is a huge accomplishment if you didn't have all the rest of the accomplishments. Just throwing that out there. Now, um, thank you for being here. So I'm going to just introduce myself um, to those who don't know me. I'm Eve Goldberg, and in 2015, I founded Big Vision Community, a New York City-based nonprofit. Um, in 2014, I lost my son Isaac to an accidental opioid overdose. And I would say that Big Vision was something that Isaac wished he had had, and I wished that it had existed for him, but he just couldn't find it. It's a, a sober peer-to-peer -peer community lifeline that shows young people ages 18 to 35 that their social life isn't over when they stop using substances. We redefine recovery as exciting and fun, offering over 500 activities free of charge where people can discover new passions, learn life skills, and see how to live productive lives. We've helped over 10,000 young people sustain their recovery. I thank you all for joining us today. So I have some questions for you and then I'm gonna, you know, that I have written up and I'm gonna go totally off of them also because I have so many other questions because I've seen some of your interviews and you know, your, your life story is, is fascinating to me and I think will be to a lot of, a lot of people out there. So, you know, I look at you and you have 30 plus years in recovery. You're an amazing example of what is possible in long-term sobriety. So first, if you would just share some of your story with us. It's, I don't know if you know, some people might be aware of it and some not. So if you can share your personal journey and what brought you to this awareness that recovery was necessary for your life. Sure, and, and thanks for having me, Eve, and, and thank you for all you do and your entire team at, at Big Vision. Um, you know, getting folks um, through the early period of recovery is incredibly challenging, and, and that's where we lose people. And, and you told the story of your son, so your work is, is so important. And one of the great things about my job is I, I get to meet, you know, courageous people like you who are able to channel grief into passion, into change, and, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I, I decided to, to break my anonymity um, my first year in office. I, I was um, given the assignment to be chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, and with two of my colleagues, we founded our state task force on opioids addiction overdose prevention, and we toured around the state, and the number one issue that we heard as an impediment for treatment and recovery was stigma. And so I found it very hard to, to be the one leading the charge against stigma if I wasn't going to tell my story. And so um, a reporter from the New York Times sort of gleaned some things from my, my statements and, and what he'd heard about me, and, and I broke my anonymity. I, I thought it was important to. And my story is no different than anybody else who's listening. Um, you know, it was one of desperation and despair and lack of hope and, and, you know, not wanting to live, not wanting to die, not knowing how to live, um, you know, just hitting a really egregious emotional bottom. And it wasn't until later in my recovery after doing some work 
that a lot of my early use, and I, I started when I was a teenager, was about um, uh, self-medicating depression and anxiety. And, you know, that has, has, as we've learned, colored a lot of the science in our work around prevention um, because the self-medicator, the, the depressed and, and the traumatized teens of today are our users and abusers of tomorrow. And so that really colors a lot of our prevention work is getting more mental health access to our young people, especially in schools, so, so that they don't repeat that pattern of self-medication. So I, I got, had the opportunity to get sober in, in my early 20s. I went away to treatment. I came back uh, to New York. I was living in New York City. I was not employed at the time, so I had a lot of time on my hands and went to a lot of church basements, as, as we do early on. Um, and, and people who are watching knows what that vernacular means. And, and I, I hooked up with a lot of people in early recovery. And we, we just went to meeting, to meeting, to meeting. We went to the coffee shop. We went to meetings. And then, you know, because none of us were working, we didn't have money. We tried to find ways to have fun and enjoy ourselves without a lot of money. We'd mm -hmm. go hang out in Central Park. We'd take the subway to the beach out in Queens. Um, and, and we found that, that there were things that we could do communally that weren't focused on direct recovery, um, but, but were just fun things to do and we could build those bonds. And, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of those people today. Um, thank yep. God many of them have long-term recovery as well. Members of my family are there. Some of my best friends are. Um, but sadly, we've lost some people on the way. This is a, a pernicious disease. Um, but it was uh, a series of steps of, um, you know, going away, having access to treatment. And, and, and then, you know, I look at all of the privilege that I had, and that colors a lot of my work. A lot of my work in, in the Senate is about breaking down barriers so other people have access to the same things I did, you know, it was was uh, insurance, treatment, aftercare, healthcare, uh, therapy, medication, whatever those things are that people need, um, you know, there are barriers, whether, whether they are racial barriers, whether they are barriers of, of distance, whether treatment deserts in upstate or downstate. Um, and then on the recovery side, you know, transportation, access, access to employment, access to, to uh, health care, you know, all of those kind of social determinants of health that, that and, and they're also determinants of a successful recovery that I had, we want to break down barriers for folks in New York. So that's a little of my story and, and how it colors some of my work. So I, I, in one of um, your interviews that I listened to or that I watched, you talked about hitting rock bottom in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you and I are about the same age, by the way. <laughs> so I, You're I, 29. Yeah, of course. Of course, the 80s, wait a second, let's be realistic, because that would mean we weren't around in the 80s. So we got to, you can't fudge it that much. But yeah, we're in our 30s. Um, so the 80s were a crazy time. I remember. I remember what it was like being in New York City. I remember going to clubs. I remember, you know, drug use was rampant back then. But I didn't have any friends who, at that point, I mean, were dying, you know, from the drugs that we were using. And I feel like New York City, or like a lot of cities, has become kind of a, a free-for-all today and kind of, you know, difficult to navigate if you're trying to stay sober, you know, more, more so than it was. And the drugs today obviously are lethal, you know, where back then, you know, you didn't find it. So what, what, how do you think you would have fared today in, you know, as opposed to what it was like in the eighties? You know, that, that's a great question. And you hit the nail on the head is back when, when we were in the eighties, you were, you were seeing overdose deaths nationally in the single thousands. I, I think 20 years ago it was something like six or 7,000 people died a year from overdose. 
compared to the 120,000 a year now. Mm -hmm. and, and fentanyl is a massive part of that. Yep. You know, there's just no second chance with fentanyl. And so a lot of the work that we have to do is in the harm reduction area, because there are some people who are just not ready for treatment. You know, when, when I was, you know, hitting bottom, it still took me about a year and a half before I was really open to treatment. So we know there are people, so our mission has to be to keep them alive. Yeah. And, and that has to do with, with Narcan accessibility, Narcan training, fentanyl strips, um, syringe exchange. So a lot of that kind of work we need to do today. And, and it's still about breaking down stigma. You know, when you, when you see the headlines in the New York Post and they use the word junkie about people lying in the street, as opposed to recognize that someone who's sick and that someone who's brother or sister or father or mother. Um, so, so we still have that stigma that we have to deal with and, and realize that we can't arrest our way out of a public health crisis. I completely agree on that. And I have to say that, you know, before, I mean, Isaac, my son Isaac passed away um, eight years ago. Mm. And there was less conversation back then about this. And there was, you know, nobody even spoke about Narcan back then. Nobody, I mean, it existed, but no one spoke about it. It wasn't being distributed. And the, the stigma was even greater. I and mean, we're talking like nine, 10 years ago when he was trying to, you know, to get, get his life back on track. And he didn't want to talk about it. And he really, he felt so much shame. Yeah. And, you know, Isaac, you know, grew up with a pretty privileged life. Um, and, you know, so people looked at me and it was like, like, oh, my God, that happened to you. It could happen to anybody. So it kind of, you know, at Isaac's funeral, I think it was the first time a lot of people knew his story because we got up there and we spoke very openly about what, how he died. You know, I did, we didn't lie about it. It was like, this is what happened. Isaac had disease and... You know, it gave people some understanding, but most people don't get that at all. They really don't understand it. And when they see someone on the street with a needle in their arm, they, they think of them as junkies. They don't see them as like, my son could have, Isaac could have ended up being that person on the street. Um, he was lucky that he had money, you know, lucky and unlucky in a way, because, you know, he was able to keep using. He should have gotten thrown in jail and maybe it would have saved his life. But um, that I know. We don't think that that's not the right way. But at the time, it might have like kept him. I know parents who felt like if my child's in jail, at least I know they're safe. Yeah. Than being on the streets. Um, but anyway, so, um, you know, for us, you know, we feel like treatment is very important. We know a very small percentage of people get treatment. I think it's like 10 percent. But like what happens after treatment? People still believe that 30 days in a treatment center and you're cured. And we know that is so far from the truth. So what were the tools that like got you? You said it took you like a year after you hit bottom to like get back on track. Like what tools did you get when you were in treatment? What did you like, what helped you figure out like, besides, you know, going to meetings, like what helped you like figure out like, this is the life that I need? That, that's a really good question. And, and just to, to backtrack, one of the reasons that the treatment is not working is that we're not treating co-occurring disorders. You right. know, fully 75% or more of people who go into treatment for substance use disorder have an underlying um, mental health disorder that we're, our system is not geared to treat. We have two separate agencies, OASIS and OMH. We have two separate funding streams. You know, double the bureaucracy for families to go through, double the bureaucracy for treatment providers. So that's one of the things we're working on is merging those two into one seamless behavioral health system. But you know, the, the, the connection, you know, this is a disease of isolation. So the connections in early recovery are um, so important. And that's one of the reasons why the pandemic was so damaging was because it, it sort of fractured what, what little connection You, I don't hear you now. I think you got muted somehow or froze. Okay, hold on. Okay, you're back. I'm sorry about that. We, we reached our time limit. I told you I'm new to this platform. Um, 
so so during the pandemic you know you're already dealing with a disease of isolation and then the despair the financial dislocation um made it very very hard and that's where things like like telehealth come into play you know so we can maintain those connections but but for me it was about the new friendships that that I was making with other people on the journey in early recovery and and then finding in in addition to the things that I was doing in my recovery formally you know and finding ways back into life slowly to be productive again and and so I I went back into my field um about 6 or 7 months into recovery um at a, a slightly lower level which was fine you know I needed to learn how to like be an adult in the workplace again um and and so I was able to at that level manage my recovery and my employment um so that that was an important step back um and then after a few years was reeling realizing it wasn't about just a job it was about something more meaningful for me and enriching for me um which was which was a career perhaps as opposed to just having a job um and then and then you know finding other ways to to do service and interpersonal relationships um but it it you know it's a process and it it takes time and we need to have those safeguards around us so if it's after care um and and you know for folks who live in rural areas transportation is a killer because there is no public transit and so we need to find better ways in addition to telehealth you know doing some transportation pilots so people can get the connectedness that they need right i i know a big vision has always been about in person events so yeah. covid hit it was, we lost so many people i mean lost lost people that no. passed and we also just lost people who were probably isolating in their basement and you know drinking and couldn't face people and it was really tough to get people to join virtual events to, to do anything you know so i i totally understand that isolation part and i understand it from isaac cuz isaac did, couldn't go back to hanging out with his old friends who were drinking and and doing drugs and so you know he would do things like you know exercise 9 10 o'clock at night anything to like get the endorphins going and anything to yeah. get busy and that was kind of what spoke to me after he passed away was you know wanting to do something cuz i realized he didn't know he couldn't even go to a restaurant cuz it was always a big bar scene right right so challenging just to be feel like normal you know when you're early in recovery um and so i mean the fact that you are the chairman of the senate committee of alcoholism and substance abuse must be very meaningful for you i would imagine and when you were when you got this position it wasn't because they knew that you were in recovery correct or correct did, correct correct so oh. you know i i had i had i had asked for it but but did not say why and then when when i was given the chairmanship um you know i i realized this was an opportunity to give back you know that i had had a lot of advantages along the way and and this was an opportunity for me to use this platform to give back to others the way they had given back to me it's a, it's really amazing and i'm sure that you you know i we we know that you're doing a lot of great work but there i think you introduced how many bills did you introduce um 16 i, I, think, I think we've done 89 so far on substance use disorder um is you know some that's some big some meaning? small is there one that's most meaning sorry is there one that's like most meaningful i think i think ending prior authorization for medication assisted treatment because what was happening was people in withdrawal would go for a doctor's office and we would have that narrow window to actually get them on medication and and get them started in treatment and and physicians and their staffs would spend 4 5 6 hours on the phone with an insurance company whether it be Medicaid or private insurance fighting 
to get authorization to put this patient on medication assisted treatment and and they were getting too sick and going out to the street and we were losing them and so there's one study that predicted this will save 500 lives a year in new york so you know even if it saves one it was certainly worth it sure i agree with that um one of the other things that you had said in your past interview was you know, trying to get them to put um, safe needle, safe needle exchange. Um, is that what safe needle well, exchange or? Well, there's needle exchange, and then there are also supervised consumption sites. Supervised consumption. And one of the things you said was that, um, you know, people would rather have a new park in their neighborhood than a, than want to have a, a safe consumption site next door. So that obviously has to do with stigma. So what? How is that? How how can we change that? How can we change people? You're, you're right. It's about it's about the stigma, and if if we as a society are are saying that we are a compassionate society and we value life, um, supervised consumption centers or overdose prevention centers, as we call them. Um, there are two in New York City right now that have saved over 500 lives. We went and visited the ones in Toronto, in Canada, and there has not been a single fatality at an overdose prevention center anywhere in the world. So would we rather have people dying in McDonald's and Starbucks restrooms, or would we rather have a medical facility where people can go and get their needs addressed and their lives saved and and then start that relationship, that bridge, so when someone is ready for treatment, that the hand is already out and the relationship is established. Now, uh, are there statistics on, let's say, people in Canada where they have these sites where they have actually, you know, turned their lives around after that and gone on to be like very productive? And I mean, some of those people could be productive to begin with. There are people who can be using and still live very productive lives. But, um, you know, there's statistics on that and like what what happens after. Yeah, and, and you know, the reality is it, it gives someone who may not be ready to get into treatment, there's, there's a bridge being built and a relationship being formed because when people are at their bottom, there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of isolation. And, and people aren't ready to just jump into treatment necessarily. And so that arm is extended. And, you know, have you had a hepatitis test recently? Have you had a HIV test recently? You know, you want to talk about treatment? How are you feeling about treatment these days? And, and that trusted bond is being built. And then the relationship is there when someone is ready for treatment. So it's not just keeping folks alive in the short term, it's a bridge to long-term recovery. Well, I think somehow we need people to understand what a safe consumption site is because they just think of, you know, drug addicts going in there and shooting up, you know, in, in, and, and we're paying for it. That's how people look at it. We have to change that mindset, you know, that people have. And that to me is, that's a big challenge. And, and you mentioned the, the finances of it. We are paying far more by not treating people and not bringing people into the system. Mm -hmm. We're paying for it in the criminal justice system. We're paying for it in the healthcare system. Um, you know, our economy suffers because of it. One of our task force committee hearings, a chamber of commerce in a neighborhood in the Bronx said we would like an overdose prevention center in our business district so that people have a safe place to go instead of the restrooms of our stores and shops. It makes perfect sense. We just have to, we just, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a PR thing, you know, yeah. people have to sort of understand it because all they hear that, you know, what it is and they're like, no, 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 we don't want it in our neighborhood, but they have to understand what the alternative is, which is happening now. And we see it everywhere on the streets. Now we see people with needles in their arms and obviously, you know, law enforcement is doing nothing about it, you know, and there's nothing's being done about it. So it's just, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a good look for the city and we're not, you know, I agree with you about co-occurring disorder. I feel like anybody who has an addiction or is dealing with addiction 
has a, something else going on. There's another, there's a mental health issue going on there because you don't medicate yourself for no reason. Right, and, and if we are getting to somebody for the first time, either in the criminal justice, the criminal justice system or on a subway platform, our system has failed. Yep. You know, we, we need a better job of capturing folks, even, even the acutely ill ones. Yep, totally. Um, so is there anything that you're working on now in the Senate that we should know about that, you know, is, will help save young lives? Anything, anything new that you're working on? That well, I, I think the big one is, um, has to do with the merger of Oasis and okay. OMH. We passed it twice in the Senate. We haven't gotten it through the assembly, so we're hopeful that next year, I mean, that will really provide comprehensive care. We also have a bill that would um, better assess college students, you know, very much like your son or like me. You know, why is, why is someone from, you know, a good high school who did well academically, why are they suddenly failing out of college? You know, how do we better assess what's going on with our young people so, so we have a bill to do comprehensive analysis about college students. We're also working on recovery housing um, on college campuses because, you know, you're talking about those triggers that your son faced. He couldn't, he couldn't go back to the world he knew. So let's create a world that's safe for them. And so people can get back with their lives, get back into higher education and not just have a dorm where alcohol is, is frowned upon, but actually have recovery wraparound services there for those individuals. Listen, alcohol should be found upon in any dorm, if you think about it. Most of these kids are 18 years old, I mean, 19 years old. It should never be okay. But listen, I, my daughter went to, to college and we, we would go and visit her and it was shocking before the way they would pregame, before a football game, it was shocking to see what went on there. My husband and I would see people like falling into the street. It was really scary and um, just made, and, and Isaac always wanted to go visit her. She was at like a big 10 school. She, he always wanted to go to a game. He couldn't go. I mean, he couldn't go. He was, you know, tr he was early in recovery and it was just a huge trigger for him. You yeah. Know? So it, it's, you know, I like for us a big vision, I want to make this world like a safer place for people who don't want to use substances. Like, you know, you shouldn't have to, you should be able to go to a party and people shouldn't say, oh, you don't drink, you're so boring. Or, right. and, or how are you gonna have fun, you know? People say that all the time, well, why don't you have one drink? Stop, you know, don't say that to people because some people, like we have to understand, they can't have one drink. Right, right. I remember years ago, uh, a Yankee Stadium, they experimented with a sober section, but it was it was completely segregated. It was like right. the upper deck in the outfield, all the, all the way over. Oh. You know, they were not great seats, and and you're the people who sat there were made to feel like like they were on display. You know, it was so. You're right. We absolutely have to find ways um, to to integrate young people back into everyday activities without the pressure and the threat of alcohol and drugs. Right, well, I have to tell you, we, now, Christine, if you're on here, put it, if you can put it in the, the uh, on the screen, the name of the, org there's an organization that what they do is they buy, like get tickets to these football games or baseball games. And in the parking lot, they have a, what do you call it when you pregame for Tailgate. They do it, it's sober tailgate. And and then they're in this like sober section. They all people all go together, and they offered us tickets. And oh, we, terrific! Yeah, we sent like thirty people there, and it was amazing. Like this is what the organization. Oh, sober A F E A F E whatever. Yeah, but it was it was fantastic. Like I, I was thrilled. You know, so we we're always looking to partner with people who are doing those kind of things, you know, we can't do everything, you know, big vision is, um, you know, right now we're local, we're planning on expanding, you know, in the US, um, we're doing an initiative now that's going to be, um, you know, in 16 cities where we're going to be partnering with this or this 
group called Sands Bar from Austin, Texas, and we're going to be doing sober parties, sober, you know, in, in all these cities in 2003. So it's, yeah, it's going to be very exciting. And we just purchased a space, so it's going to be our clubhouse. And once a month, we're going to have a, you know, a sober dance party there, and we're going to do all sorts of activities. And it's going to be the hub, you know, for rec recovery, things, all things recovery in New York City. We're really excited about it. So the question, uh, another question I have for you is, why does all the money go to treatment? We need more money to go recovery support services. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and we're working on that. Um, one of the bills I have is to allow for peers to bill not related to a treatment program. So for a clubhouse like you're about to open, you may want to employ peers. Um, and unless you are affiliated with a treatment program, you cannot bill for those peers. So we have a bill to address that because we know peers are such a valuable bridge back and connection for folks that you shouldn't necessarily have to be part of a treatment program to be able to bill for peers. So, so that's important. Yeah. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is in recovery housing. There are no standards in New York State. So you go from really safe and, and almost clinical recovery housing you know, for people who can't go back to their old environment. And, and there are, are veritable, you know, drug dens that, that claim their recovery housing. And we've heard some horrible stories. So we work with the governor and our colleagues in the assembly. Um, and in this year's budget, we, for the first time, uh, are, are going to be certifying recovery houses in New York. And the first step of that is identifying what the standards will be and then in the beginning, it will be a voluntary certification process. Uh, they will present their credentials to OASIS, whatever, whatever the specs are laid out. And then eventually, it'll be, it'll be compulsory for, for all of them in the state. So we want to give folks a safe place to live, but we need more money for recovery housing. You yep. know, we, we have people who come to us every day and say, I found a house, I found a property, I have three peers. We're ready to go, but I don't have money. Mm. And yet it's very hard for Oasis to fund that unless it's really supportive housing. So, you know, every every day we find different things. You know, I travel around the state literally every year um, to find out what the obstacles are and what the barriers are. And that's why we keep cranking out the legislation. So, you know, there's no silver bullet to change the entire system. But, you know, a day at a time, we keep plugging those holes and, and pushing the ball up the hill. That is fantastic. I think that's great because I think, I mean, recovery houses can be amazing, but there are so many that are just not good and they should, they, they need to be accredited, you know, right. be like anything else. You know, it's really important. I mean, we, I had one young man who came to all of our events and he was doing really well and he needed to move into sober living. And I found him a place to live. They, I helped him out. They gave it for a very low cost. And um, within a week, they had him dispensing meds to the other, to the other people living there. And I'm, because he wasn't paying full, you know, full boat there. And so they were like, oh, we'll use him to work. And I said, are you kidding me? And what do you think happened? Do I have to tell you what happened? Yeah. Oh, obvious, my goodness. Obvious. Not, not good. And it was really, it was really upsetting. Um, Anyway, I, um, is there anything else that you want to share with us? I want to open it up and see if people have questions. No, I, I'd love to hear what, what your, your community has to say. Okay, so I'm going to open it up now and see if we have any, any questions. Anybody who has questions for the senator, for Pete? I was told you like to be called Pete. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my name. That's your name. Do a good greeting to you. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Uh, I joined, joined, joined. Uh, well, so far, I don't see any questions. Anybody have any questions? Just post them and we will be happy to answer them. All right. Well, maybe we, we fill them in on everything. There's got to be a question out there. No such thing as a, a bad question. All nope. questions are good questions. Exactly. Um, 
When did you go into treatment, by the way? What age? 27. 27. Yeah. So you were already like in the working world. Yeah. Got it. And what made you go into, into treatment? Like, did somebody influence you to do that? You know, there, there had people in my life who had suggested it, but it wasn't until I was uh, emotionally bereft that I was, I was ready to really um, embrace it. Yeah. Listen, thank you both for everything you're doing for the sober community. Um, okay, any other comments, questions? I probably have some more. Um, what about, so September now is recovery month. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, so what, what, are, what is being done? What, do you have anything, any special plans, anything that you're doing for recovery month? Well, we, there's, there's a recovery run um, that is a number of organizations collaborate on um, in uh, FDR Park in Yorktown. I'll be going up this Saturday um, there's a, a big gathering in Albany in, in the big park right in the middle of the city. So I'll be celebrating with some folks up there. Um, and, and we've done a couple other, uh, events as well. Um, but you know, we, we just try and be supportive and be a cheerleader. Yeah, we, we have a lot, we have a lot, um, that we're planning for recovery month. Um, and oh, here someone said, I know she said, no question. We want to thank you both for the work you do and your support. We met a peer last week who wants to bring big, big vision to Carmel, but doesn't have funding. Would love more recovery funding. Recovery. Yeah, that, you know, I probably met with them because it's, it's the peers who want to build recovery housing for women in Carmel, New York, which is in my <laughs> district in Putnam County. So that, we, may be, we may be talking about the same people. Well, this, this is a young man who, um, his name is Joseph. I don't know if he's on here. If you're on here, Joseph, you can ask a question. Um, but he came to all of our events. He's amazing. And it's been, we haven't seen him in a couple of years, and he's really doing well in his recovery. And that's where he's from and um, moved back to his hometown. And he called me up and he said, I, I want to do something here. I feel like this, it's really needed in this, you know, in, in this area. And so I said, let's just... Oh, that's interesting, because a woman came to us from Carmel with the same request. Joseph met Victoria. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. The connection was made. Ah, okay, good. That's great. Yeah, he's, he's amazing, and he just wants to give back, and, you know, we're going to totally support him. So, you know, we're, we're going to back him on this, and he's going to start the you know, a big vision in Putnam County, I guess. Very cool. Yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, so we plan on doing this throughout the country, but this was, you know, somebody who had great success with us. And so we're really excited that he wants to do this. Uh, any other questions? Oh, Johnson, that's great. Um, let me see if I have any other questions. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you about um, uh, legalization. Can we talk about that for a minute? Legalization. Sure. Like, but what you're, what you're, well, well, like I was saying, I think that this city has gotten a little crazy. I went to a show with my husband recently, and when we walked out of the show on Broadway there, there were just all these random people selling loose joints on the street, you know, and no one's stopping them and people are just getting high, you know, on the streets and nobody knows what's in that stuff. It's totally, you know, it's unlicensed. It's, you know, so I, th I think that's a reason. Well, there's legalization and decriminalization are two different things. But anyway, if you can just speak to that a little bit, like what's, what's going to happen here in New York? Right. Well, legalization will, um, uh, address those impurities in the supply chain. You know, that, that's one of the, the advantages. So my reason, and, and people were quite surprised when I, I came out in favor of legalization, given my background, but, you know, we know we can't arrest our way out of a public health crisis. And, and during the, the quote unquote war on drugs, we have decimated communities. Thousands and thousands of lives have been shattered because 
their their drug use was was criminalized and their families were destroyed their neighborhoods were destroyed and and it was just an, an abject failure and it cost taxpayers billions of dollars and we got nothing to show for it but decimated communities the other thing we know is from our own experience is is that that people are using it anyhow so this is not about creating a new market of users it's about taking the existing market of users and converting them into a legal framework where they'll be paying taxes and that tax revenue we put toward a social good so 40 percent will go to education 20 percent will go to to treatment and and um, other behavioral health services and another 40 percent will go to economic development in these it, um, economically disadvantaged communities. So we can we can have a social good out of this. I think I think the mistake that we made in the legislation was not allowing municipalities to have the flexibility to limit where people can publicly consume. You know, so we you they we say that that you can consume you can regulate wherever you regulate tobacco use, maybe a park or whatnot, but not the widespread kind of, you know, it's legal, we're not here to hassle you, but the law says you can't smoke outdoors. You gotta take it, you know, what, whatever the municipality may decide. That has been a quality of life issue that, that I think we should have addressed in the legislation we didn't. I think what's important also for people, legalization doesn't mean, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's good for you. I'll right, exactly. And there, there is an education component to this. And I don't know if you've seen them, but the state has actually been running PSAs on the health Im implications and the conversation that needs to happen around the, the impacts of, of marijuana. We're actually, I have a, a doctor on with me next week and we're gonna talk about that because he, he does, he has a business where he does drug testing. So he really understands all the implications you know, of the legal decriminalization of, of marijuana, but also that, you know, people think, oh, it's good. My parents smoke. These people, everybody smokes. It must be good for you. It's like everybody drinks. It's not good for you. And the, and the whatever, the, the marijuana today is just, it's so much more potent what people are smoking than what, you know, people did back in the 80s. Um, I see we have a question. At what point do you think children should be learning about drugs? I, I think at a point where their parents are comfortable starting to have those discussions um, and where educational professionals um, feel it's age appropriate to have those discussions. Um, you know, I, my kids were fortunate that they grew up seeing neither of their parents drink. So um, it, was, it was not an issue early on in our house, but we did have those conversations that you know, there's a reason mom and dad don't drink. Um, but, you know, every family is different. Um, but we do know there are, from our, the education professionals, there are age-appropriate lessons that can be learned at certain points. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's really up to Pete to suggest or legislate when, when people should start speaking with their kids about it. But a, a lot of this starts with parental modeling, not in every case by any means. Right. Um, but certainly on the alcohol side, you know, it's just such a normal thing for for young people to grow up in households where people drink all the time. You know, that's just what you think adults do. And as you just mentioned, there are people who come home after a hard day of work and they'll smoke and, you know, their kids are present for that. So some of this has to do with modeling and letting kids know what's safe, what's appropriate. And, and have those honest discussions. And I think the legalization of marijuana, you know, a lot of people would say, well, what about our kids? What about our kids? And this presents an opportunity for us to have honest discussions with young people about, about drugs, about drug use, and, and about what's going on in their lives that, that, that necessitates they feel they need to pick up a mood altering substance. Yep. I hear that. Um, it's there's a lot of challenges. Also, when like I said, if you walk down the street, you know, and you're with your kids in the city or wherever, and you, you know they smell the smell of New York City to me has now become 
become weed. That's like our smell. It's not garbage. It's weed. Yeah. And after it's, you, I think you have to start earlier because your kids are going to smell that and go, what is that? You, you kind of have to start having honest conversations. I, I, I don't know what age, but a younger age than you probably would want to. That's what I think. Um, whatever. That's me. Um, so any other questions? Um, I think uh, give you a last chance. Anybody have anything to say? We got a lot of hearts coming up here and waves. Um, if you have a question. Well, hearts and waves back to everybody. <laughs> um, okay. So, well, I think I thank you so much for being here. I think this was fantastic. You're an inspiration to all of us. Oh, well, thank you. You are as well. Thank you for everything you and your team are doing. It's remarkable. Thank you. I feel that maybe today, if we helped even one young person to find hope in their life, we've accomplished a lot. And hope so. we, we hope that, you know, together we'll continue to fulfill our collective missions one step at a time, saving one life at a time, because that's all that we can do. And that is the goal is saving lives. End of the day, all that we do is for that one reason. Correct? You're we right. Saving lives, hard stop. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. And I look thank forward you very to much. the person, not on the little screen. And, and I look forward to that. Look forward to working with you in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.